to imagine all life as you know it stopping instantaneously and every molecule in your body exploding at the speed of light. Total Protonic Reversal. Protonic Reversal. Protonic Reversal. With your host, Conan Neutron. Broadcasting from a secret underground lair in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. A gigantic middle finger to everything that we rock about music, rock and roll, and corporate power. The thing is, though... If you don't laugh, you're going to go on a killing spree with sharp and nails. Hold it, hold it, hold it, hold it, hold it. Confidence of a hero or a fool, I wasn't exactly certain which. Could not be more professional. It's the real world, I choose to devote my life to. That's okay. It means something, it means something. And they got away. You know, that's my take on it. Like, what's yours? Protonic River Song. That's like a science thing, right? Indeed, indeed, indeed it is. It is a science thing. It is a science place. It is a scientific fact. They were all up in your face. It's time once again for the one, the only, Protonic Reversal. Welcome to it. Welcome to it. Welcome to it. This is the, uh, the now the post-Thanksgiving uh, edition. I am, I am back. I'm back in the uh, in the in the secret underground lair, and uh, happy to be back and doing the show. Happy to be back in general. Frankly, it was quite stressful. Uh, before we get into it, though, of course, uh, is, is Stephen Hodges is tonight. Very excited to talk this man. This uh, excellent drummer, percussionist. Uh, Tom Waits, David Lynch, T Bone Burnett, um, Mavis Staples. I know him. Uh, of course, I know him as a uh, for mainstream stop valve with a beloved friend of the show, Mike Watt and Mike Bagetta. And I now know the differentiation between those uh, bands and the the stuff with Keltner, as I was instructed on the earlier episodes. If you listen to uh, the earlier episodes this year with both of those fellas, you can you can watch my gradual education as I understand what that band is, which now I know exactly what it is because I've seen them play. But before we get into any of that or the many many things that uh, Stephen Hodges have done, welcome to Conan Neutron's Protonic Reversal. I am your host, Conan Neutron. I am a rock and roll lifer. That has been touring and recording for 23 years, most known for the band Coda Neutron, The Secret Friends. Music is a huge part of my life, and I use the format of this very long running podcast to talk about music with musicians whose work I enjoy and respect, but who may not be household names. This is episode 362. Now, if this is your first time listening to the show, archives of it are available for free. No ads, no sponsors, no kidding at protonicversal.com. However, if you want to support the show and get episodes sooner, $1 a month at patreon.com slash protonicreversal will achieve that goal. If you like the show or even just a single episode, please feel free to like, subscribe on your platform of choice, share it around on the internet, or even leave a review. All of that helps people discover the show. It beats back the almighty algorithmic overlords, and it's just a darn nice thing to do, really. And that's, that's isn't that a reason to do much of anything? So, yeah, I, I had the distinct pleasure of uh, seeing an MSSV set on the way to my own tour for Conan Neutron The Secret Friends recently, and it was great after jamming out on the last MSSV record for most of the year. And it, it came up that I've had the other people in the band on. Why not have uh, the, this, this remarkable master of percussion and drumming who's played on so many uh, great records and done so much great stuff over the years, and I am very pleased to bring on Mr. Stephen Hodges. How you doing, sir? I'm doing great. Good to be with you. I, I can't. Yeah, I, I I can't believe I haven't had you on before. I, I was like, oh yeah, because when I was thinking about it, and, and I thought about it when I sort of rocked the difference between the stuff that <laughs> that they do with Keltner and MSSV, which was which is immediately apparent if you see it live, of course. I was like, God, that Hodges guy, he's done a lot of stuff. Like, I'm a huge, this is not widely known, but one of my favorite artists is Tom Waits. Sure. And I feel like, I like the earlier, loungier stuff, but I feel like Swordfish Trombones is when, you know, things got really real. Well, and, yeah. And you're you're on that. And, and that's, that's right. God, that's in, so let's start with that. Because for me, that's, okay. in the best possible way, it sounds like music from Mars. You know what I mean? Like, it's just really out there. And, and 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 it sort of changed my idea as a young punk rocker of what music could be, and a large part of that is like the, the mm -hmm. drumming and the percussion because it's so percussive. It's so right. um, <laughs> it's just like I, it's unique. It's unique in that way. So, how did you come to work with with Tom and, and Kathleen? I assume uh, on on Swordfish Trombone. Start with that. 
Right. Okay. Well, I was playing up in LA a lot at the time doing the opening for like X or the blasters or Boingo Boingo or Plimsolls. So I was with this James Harmon band. We were, we were pretty popular. We played a lot of bars. We played bars like seven nights a week, but then we would play up in LA. So that got me in front of people like Tom who would be looking around for musicians, seeing what's up. Sure. And uh, so basically long story short, that's where Tom caught sight of me. And then I did see he and Kathleen at a couple of gigs here and there, but we hadn't really spoken or anything yet. Then they just, they called and um, we did an audition sort of a, and I guess Larry and I, the bass, may he rest in peace, Larry Taylor. Yeah. Great player. Bassist. Yeah. Um, but nobody else from that first meeting, and it was at some obscure studio. I don't even remember which one it was. Um, but Larry and I persisted. Uh, we were, you know, we were kept on board. Uh, and then we went into so Sunset Sound on Sunset Boulevard, where um, Marvin Gaye, yeah. Led Zeppelin, yeah. Rolling Stones, Prince... It's a, it's a really it's a really nice studio, very old uh, California studio. So basically, that's the, the the when you mention swordfish trombones, that is the the, the debarkation, right? Because uh, it used to be ride cymbal, right? Walking bass, saxophone, strings, maybe some piano, maybe a little bit of guitar, but there, you won't hear any symbols on right. any of these records. None. Um, Heart attack and vine is is like there was a sort of like an inkling of the things yeah, were going to get weird, but it's still yeah, like right, old right. school. No, that right. was still that was right. That was like your kind of bastardized shuffle, boom, yeah, gah, gah, right. gook, kind of yes. a thing, right? So the werewolf transformation has not happened yet but maybe like the <laughs> nose looks weird or something <laughs> yeah no the, the 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 real change was when yeah swordfish was the was the what an analogy jesus <laughs> the breaking point yeah so um and it really hasn't changed since then it's only gotten yeah. you know more more so but yeah let's say okay so so okay we don't have a hi hat or we don't have a ride cymbal but we have the marimba playing what playing the eighth notes let's say right that's subdividing right so so that's what that's often what a, a hi-hat or a cymbal would play so now we have this kind of going along but it's melodic and it's in a completely different you know stratosphere is tonally so yeah it's it's already like whoa what's going on here right um so yeah uh, did and you have also, an inkling at the time that uh, I, I assume you were familiar with who he was, right? But did you have an yeah. inkling that, that this was the kind of stuff that you were going to be doing? Because it kind of seems like it could have been a surprise of like, it wait, was what a, are we doing? It was, it was a surprise. Because <laughs> it's so different, right? Because yeah. I had no idea. I had no idea where he was going to head with any of it. Right. So um, I often tell people that at the beginning of the session, I just had to resign myself that I was going to have to learn how to be a bit uncomfortable <laughs> for a while. Sure. Until yeah. I kind of got used to what, the, what was going on here. Yeah. I, I, and, and I, you know, in a lot of, especially amongst rock music, you know, the drums are kind of like the backbone of the music anyway. And if you're sort of, you can't really be on shaky ground. -ness. I mean, I suppose no, no, you could no. say crazy horse, but there's not very many examples that you could, you could say that. You have to be committed, right? Right, for yep, sure. Yep. And honestly, it wasn't it wasn't a big deal. Um, it, you know, I mean, some of it's sort of like some of it's sort of a bastardized shuffle of a sort. Yeah. But but it's a shuffle without symbols. Maybe you're riding the floor tom. You're playing the snare. You know, so maybe a bit more offbeat, but it's still kind of a kind of a blues of a sort. 
but almost you know bleak strategies blues or something right, right? Like, yeah <laughs> you can't use this drum <laughs> during this no 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 you definitely <laughs> but when you think about it when you think about well velvet underground sure they yeah. never had any symbols and make it really makes a difference so relying on that symbol is not necessary yeah. it's it's a beautiful thing but it isn't it isn't necessary and it does really shift the perspective of the music so because it became it can become a crutch right i mean there's certainly well in a way yeah i mean that's what i felt when i was when i was feeling a little bit overwhelmed by the whole thing it's like oh my god how how did i rely how did i <laughs> come so far and not realize i was kind of relying on this symbol to keep my uh, my world together so um, but that that went away pretty fast, honestly. But nonetheless, it did it did cross my mind. Yeah, there for a second. Yeah. Well, and so, how are these songs being presented to you? Does he does he like have demos? Does okay. he like slapping his legs? Like what's no. like, what, what's, well, what's happening? You know, uh, the second. <laughs> okay. Um, okay. You see, I'd spent like twenty years accompanying, being like solo performer, accompanying a room full of women dance at uh, dance right. classes, right? Yeah. Congas. Uh, sometimes I would use a drum machine and some guitar, play the piano, but a lot of just basically drumming with, with my hands. Okay. Now the teachers are always using their voice to call out the cadence of the movement. They, they don't just count the counts. They mm -hmm. kind of, they kind of move the people along with the, the to intonation and the, and the cadence of their voices and the inflections. So when Tom would come around and he would sing to me and maybe throw, his, throw an elbow up or do a dip here and what have you, I'm like, oh, well, I've been doing this for 20 years. <laughs> right, I, mean, you have, you have I can do history. this in my sleep, right? Yeah. So, so... <laughs> Because I wasn't the first one. I, I had family things. So two other guys had been into the sessions before right. I got there. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, and they're great players. But anywho, it, it, it ended up being that it was me that stayed. So because you had that visual language, you, you were, well, were like you, are, you had the experience to translate subtle cues. Yeah. Yeah. One of the, <laughs> yeah. One of the things that Tom, would uh, like when we were working on the rain dogs tour and we were rehearsing yeah. he would say i want you guys to have the precision of orchestra players but back alley sensitivities right so uh, so basically i want greasy orchestra guys right guys that are accurate but are greasy sort of so um, so there was orchestra in the sheets and uh, hoodlums on the street. <laughs> right. Exactly. So, and then also he used to carry around, it's like, it's like a couple of bricks duct taped together, but it's, it's one of those boxes of Sony it was okay. a cassette player. You could record, you could had a speaker. Sure. Sure. So he would, he might play you some African drummers. Or some sort of mambo, obscure mambo band or something. And he wasn't saying copy this, but he was kind of moving you around flavor wise. And he was trying to move you into some sort of zone. He wasn't trying to dictate necessarily, but yeah. he was trying to give you some sort of essence, you know, to move you stylistically this way or that. Yeah. A, a so shorthand to get you from point A to point B without yeah, being like, were, do this. Yeah, exactly. He had he had little little cues that he would he would work on you with. Yeah. Do you remember what the the first song? It's a long time ago. I know. Do you remember the first song that you worked on uh, I with think, that? I think it was um, sixteen shells. Nice. From the Thirty odd nice. six. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Which is like end up being kind of like one of his. Most yeah, enduring it's, tunes, really. It's a, it's a powerhouse. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's 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 one of the more shuffle. I mean, because there was there were things that were you know more yeah. you know more Latin oriented as well, um, and you know like Gin Soap Boy was is sort of a 
kind of a second line and kind of shuffle thing. But yeah, but yeah, um, 16 shells. Uh, I get that one confused with Big Black Mariah, which was on Rain Dogs. They, they, both, that has some other boom clank kind it, of it, energy. Yeah, they too. both <laughs> they both have their kind of sh- overriding shuffle thing going on. They they, so, they both seem like uh, I can only characterize it as is like the, the steampunk truck with has like you know whistles going right. like the Looney yeah. Tunes and like there's a, a beast of some kind. It's kind of yes. <laughs> in, 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 in taking what you just said. A little bit further because what i think what i realized and what i think we both realized was that he was singing me parts that were maybe like three or four different overdubs like it would be almost impossible even if you could set up all this stuff or even a steam some sort of a steam drill sample or whatever (laughs) You would have you know, to be an actual you, octopus. You, you wouldn't. You, you couldn't really do it. You know. So right. so 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 he would kind of tie me up in knots a little bit, and then Larry Taylor would say, "That's pretty good, but I think there ought to be a backbeat in there somewhere." You know. <laughs> right. So I'm like, "Thank you, Larry. Thank you." You know. So then, maybe something for the average human being to. to well, you know, they got you know, and, and Tom is totally into that as well. There yeah, has yeah, to be sure. some sort of a spike in there somewhere. Yeah, know? yeah. Like, like catch a, a backbeat in there somewhere. It, it just, so, it just may come in as a bit of an afterthought with all the you know attendance. Well, yeah, he was looking for like to. It's spices. like Cajun cooking. You know, you set the roux, you get the right. you get the spices and everything going, and you don't want to burn it, but you want to get this real flavorful thing. Yeah, yeah, and of so, course. So we got that, and then sometimes we would actually go in and add another snare drum to sweeten, to to to, to get a little bit more edge <laughs> on on where two and four would sit. Yeah. Well, and, and since yeah. you have a background, not just drum, because I, mean, I feel like uh, uh, skills in drumming and skills in percussion should overlap, and yeah. often do, but not yeah. not always. But since you have that uh, that in your for me box they already, do, for sure, yeah, for yeah. sure, yeah, yeah. 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 That you can think about things uh, differently because, yeah, you're like you're at just to extend the analogy, you're adding like different flavors on in, in, with, with the spices, right? So yeah, yeah. And so that's uh, does that come together? Does that record come together quickly? I mean, do you have like moments where you're like, what are we doing? Like, what is, what what is well, this that we're doing? No, it, it, it um, it, fairly fast, fairly fast. I mean, there. He would, you know, he's he's gonna he's gonna say stuff that's gonna be like non musical somehow, right. you know, like make it more green or or <laughs> you know make it more like a, a octopus or something. Or I don't know, you know, right, something right. more oblique but, strategies. Sure. Yeah, yeah, but but uh, yeah, he, what he would do would be he would he would get something started and then we would we would do a little bit and then he might take a cruise around the room because we're kind of set up in a really large oval. So we're not on top of each other or not okay. set up like a band, but we all have our little stations and we're mildly goboed off. So we have little walls between us, but we, we're visual. We can see everybody and we're within, you know, earshot, of course, you know. So yeah. uh, then he would kind of cruise around the room give everybody a little whatever pep talk or a you know a little adjustment and then he'd go back in you know i forget i guess he had a little station where he would sing from and then give it another shot but yeah once once we got rolling it it it, it went pretty it went pretty well you know the the, the first thing of just tr- trying to get that shuffle together um because it does have its own, see, it's folk music. Right. It's sure. all folk yeah. music. It's all based off of black folk music, basically. But the key is how originally you can kind of bend the the the, the folk style of it to your own styling. Then you're actually not just copying something but you're using a form, 
but you're bringing your own essence. You're bringing your own style to it. And because you can, you can directly relate back everything he's doing to, Oh, well, that's a, that's a slow mambo or this is a, you know, but, but he's got his own little bent and that's, that's why he's reinvented the same old thing. Absolutely. It really is. It really is the same old thing. But it's his way. It, but it's uh, uniquely him, and uniquely in a way that no one was really expecting from him if they hadn't been paying too much exactly. attention. Exactly that that too. Because and a lot of people, you know, it's kind of like when Miles decided he didn't want to do the cool anymore. Right. A lot of people are like, He's "Done oh, with Bob. <laughs> this is horrible." What you know, bitches brew. Oh, he lost. But, but he, but the the overall artistic game is like, it can't be. It's just like over the top. It, it, the world wouldn't be the same if Miles hadn't changed or if, or if Tom hadn't made shifts in his, his Absolutely. approach. Absolutely. Yeah. And even though if it was not understood at all at the time, like people later yeah. understood yeah. it. Like, again, and from my perspective, I'm looking at it, you know, completely from the other angle of like coming at it from the world of punk rock and being like, wow, I never sure. really heard music like in this style, like played this way this is like really interesting you know it is sort of otherworldly yeah it is yeah and he's got things like i mean the whole uh okay so like in the neighborhood for instance right oh yeah sounds like you know for all the world like a marching band or something (laughs) but it's like this this crazy thing yeah that was really special yeah because because he sat at the piano and we had this horn section with trombones and trumpet and tuba baritone and these guys like you haven't ever heard people play dynamics until you've heard horn players because the way they can squeeze those dynamics out and what have you and victor feldman may he rest in peace he's like one of the most famous la studio musicians ever he's piano but all sorts of percussion and everything so he did percussion so he says, I'm playing the snare drum. So I said, okay. <laughs> like, I'm going to tell Victor Feldman. Yeah, no, yeah, you got it, bud. <laughs> yeah. So I, I, sounds okay. So I gave him my, you know, we had a, I had my snare, ace, I had a few snares. I, I put a snare. He says, well, this is a real good snare. So I said, thank you. So anyway, I'm playing the bass drum and the cymbal, and Tom is sitting there at the piano. And we're cutting this thing live, and I'm just I'm I, I got tears. This is this shit is yeah. off the hook. It's so it's so deep, and these horns with this these dynamics and this shit is like off the hook, just amazing. So, yeah, in the neighborhood is pretty special. Yeah, for sure. Well, because it's because it works just completely stripped down. It's a really well, beautiful it's song. Salvation but... Army Band. Yeah, well, yeah exactly. totally. Because yeah. it's like it's like yeah. the end of uh, that Fellini movie or something mm-hmm. where everyone's yeah. like, you know, <laughs> gallivanting around. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, uh, you know, and, 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 you know, I mean, Tom, man, he knows where to grab stuff from, you know, yeah, and yeah. he's, he's, he'll, he, you know, he'll do Waltz and Matilda and, and, you know, the melody is already kicking your ass, you know, bringing tears to your eyes. And then he'll put his own story to that melody. Absolutely. He's done that a lot, you know, so, so he may have been referencing that Fellini movie. Who knows? Uh, yeah, know? I mean, maybe, you know, who, it's because, through the me grinder, right? <laughs> he, he's, he, he absolutely has, has his ears wide open for what, he wants to borrow or steal. What does they say? The good ones borrow and the best the ones The best steal. ones steal, yes. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. He definitely knows where, what to what to use, for sure. Yeah. So so what's the difference uh, between uh, working on that excellent record and something like Rain Dogs, which is just, uh, like, sprawling to a certain degree? Well, Rain you know? Dogs was, was easier because we had already broken through any of the learning curve right so um so like uh it was sort just sort of a continuation really it really was 
to me, it was a continuation. Um, you have things like uh, Jockeys Full of Bourbon, which is, yeah, you know, yeah. got your Latin thing going on. Yeah. Then um, Walking Spanish. He kept saying, do that bass drum, kind of that back backbeat you know, play the bass drum after the backbeat, you know, kind of like a, like Jackie Wilson, you know? Right. Right. <laughs> so, <laughs> nice. Nice. <laughs> so I, you know, you know, so, yeah. Um, and it's, it's a pretty sparse and pretty open uh, drum part really. But there again, you know, just the mild little tweaks make it, you know, and then, um, well, let me see. Well, you get to, there's like, you get to share a track with Keith Richards. Uh, you know, oh, yeah. That's pretty cool. I met Keith <laughs> that Richards. That guy's getting good. <laughs> yeah. I, yeah. <laughs> Gotta love him, man. Um, we met him at the Beacon Theater when we were playing uh, Co-Bill with Dylan and Mavis. Beacon is in New York. Nice, nice. And um, when I met him, I was so overwhelmed that he was so genuinely uh, a big-hearted gentleman. I could I couldn't I didn't even occur to me to pimp the fact that that he played on all the tracks that I played drums on. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> on Rain Dogs. I couldn't even <laughs> pimp myself, you know. Right, I, right. I, I was just like sort of meeting him and just like damn. <laughs> Cuz I mean, we I always like Keith, right? I of mean, course. A, How can a lot not? of people do, of course. Of yeah. course. But but I felt like I found out why it isn't just because he knows how to leave space. Da, 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 yeah. Da, 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 yeah, yeah. You know, instead of just strumming all the time, you know, right. he leaves those spaces, and all of a sudden, just by that fact, he creates a part, you know. But anyhow, anyway, um, yeah. So, so yeah, he played basically on all the things that that I had played drums on, which was cool. But you know, we did like. A country song, Blind Love. You Blind know, Love, uh, it's a great uh, tune. Yeah, yeah um, The first song we ever did was before we even got into the big, um, <clears throat> shit, I can't even remember. I think it was NBC. Or so. We were in this really old studio with these like 60-foot ceilings and all this wood coving and giant drapes that you yeah. could pull. I mean, it was it was an amazing space that we recorded, but the first song was recorded in some little room somewhere. I don't even know where that was. And nobody on that session ended up on the rest of the session. Oh. Except Mark Mark Rebo. <laughs> oh yeah. And he came back after I was gone. Oh but, okay. but we recorded it live and that was that that was a good take, right? So yeah, that, yeah, sure. they accepted yeah, that it. one, right? Right, right. And that was like, you know, you know that was the, like the typical, the, the archetypical storybook uh, nursery rhyme. We all go to heaven in a little rope boat, clap hands. You know? <laughs> right, yeah. So I'm yeah. just like singing, singing this <laughs> nursery rhyme to myself. Yeah. And the song is practically playing itself. the The bass player was Tony Gargano. He plays. I don't know if he's still like 25, 28 years with Dylan. He's been his band leader. He oh, played wow. the bass. Rebo was on guitar, played this insane solo on there. He's a and real I, cool player, man. Oh, like, yeah. I no, I, I love his playing for sure. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, we did a session together not long ago. And, oh, nice. and it was really neat. Anyway, and I forget who the percussionist was, but they did a great job, you know. But But it ended up that none of those guys came back. Larry came in and played the bass. Yeah. And then... A week or so later, Michael Blair came in and started playing percussion. But he, but here's 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 the Rain Dogs thing too is that he started doing like things you know like the more like the more kind of German Berlin cemetery da 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 boom da 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 boom da 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 boom boom you know it's like. It's just it's just kind of obvious what you need to play when you really just go with it, you know. And so, um, but that was really that was really fun. Yeah, you know, there's a there's a really cool. If you ever want to check it out, just go on YouTube and type in 
Tom Waits um, on the tube. The tube was early Jules Holland. You know, Jules oh Holland. yeah, yeah, of course. I mean, this yeah, is like probably sure. his first show. Then it, it wasn't even in London. We did it on the BBC with Mavis, but that was way that was in the 2000s. This was like 1985. Right. But but they they did a great job of of the sound and the filming of about five or six songs. Uh, Big Black Mariah, uh, Cemetery Polka, In the Neighborhood, Walk in Spanish. Oh, yeah. man, they put a reverb on the snare, on the backbeat, on on, on uh, Walk in Spanish. Man. I, that, it's, it's stellar. It's just going to be wild sounding, yeah. Yeah, so <laughs> hey, you can check that out if you want to hear what Tom Waits, the Rain Dogs tour sounded like. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's how, how. So how was that tour as an experience? I mean, it's got to be kind of different from... Uh, from from a lot of other bands, this is based oh, on the, yeah. the flying circus I mean, elements of it. Yeah, right? no, people, I mean, you know, like we rub shoulders with different people, R.E.M., yeah. um, Elvis Costello, Cot O'Reardon, who was playing bass for the Pogues at the time. Oh, and sure. She and, yeah. she and um, Elvis were, uh, were together at the time. But, um, yeah, I guess... Because we weren't playing like normal kind of parts, they were they were like the guys from REM were like, "How the hell does this all stay together?" You know? <laughs> sure, yeah, because you have no frame of reference. It just but, but like we're native. all counting in the same quarter note. You know, it's no big right, deal. Right. You know, but but to the outside ear, it was like, "What the heck is going on here?" In a way, but. Um, you know, once you were in it and you got used to it, it wasn't, it was just, you see, the thing about Tom is that he really knows how to set you up. He writes great music. He writes great. It's a good start. The, yeah. The, part, the parts, <laughs> the parts kind of, the parts are good, but they also kind of allow you, I don't know, for some people's music, if you do certain things, you kind of trigger my ability to just go further with it right. somehow, because you've 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 your the magic in you has kind of unlocked something in me, in the magic in me, and so I gotta say that some of the you know a lot of the parts that he creates, they have that. And that's 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 really special. You know, that it's not like every session you go to, you're picking up like really strong vibes like you pray that you will have. But some sessions I've had some dogs of the sessions, you know, to where <laughs> right. I, I can't I can't. I mean, I'm maybe not being I'm maybe not in my best mental or whatever as well, but I'm not. There's no vibe for me here. Yeah. You know? So I got kind of nothing to go on you're not going to be able to dig deep if it's a no, surface thin yeah uh, uh, but with tom there's an awful lot there for sure yeah uh i i'm such a huge fan of uh well vim vendors but especially until the end of the world i think it's such a cool yeah cool yeah. film uh, in fact that we covered it uh last year on the movie show that i'm on and i just so happened to uh simon bonnie from um Crime the City Solution was on recently on this show. Mm -hmm. And it just reminded me once again how stellar that soundtrack is. In a way that I feel like there's there's a a small echelon of 90s films that have like just these soundtracks that are far better than they have any right to be. But the, the care and attention <laughs> and the idea of like, oh, this is going to be an exclusive song for this. Yeah. Uh, is uh, it shows really, and I think that that's a kind of a good entry point into that. How did so? How did that? How did that come on your radar? Because that's a few years later. That's like what ninety one, right. right? Yeah. Dave Alvin had been going up oh, of course, with yeah. the bass player Don Falzone and doing some experimentation recording with with David Lynch and. Um, they wanted a drummer or they wanted a different drummer. I, I don't know this, the circumstance, but anyway, we started going up 
and I met a, met David Lynch, and we started, you know, working on just different bits, you know, different grooves, yeah. different this and that. Um, <clears throat> I'm not sure if the uh, S- Summer Kisses, Winter Tears was. I guess Dave Alvin was still in there. Um, there, there was a situation where when we did Fire Walk with Me, uh, yeah. pink, the Pink Room, um, David was in San Francisco and he didn't want to come home in time to do the session the next day. And that's where you got Dave Jarecki. That's where Jarecki right. came into uh, the picture. Sorry, Jarecki, and then sorry. all of a sudden, yeah. And then all of a sudden, it's like, kind of like, well, who's... Who's Dave Alvin? You know, because Ricky is like <laughs> it's so perfect like, for that. Yeah. Well, no, he's he's like he's like for men my world, other than like you know Mark Rebo and you know my buddy Smokey Hormel, different. Yes, yeah, but yeah. but 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 David Jariki was at least in my calendar chronological at age twenty. He was the first guitar player I ever met that was just like, oh my god. This guy is so freaking good at guitar. He can he can just morph himself into anything, and he yeah. he plays so well. And so, um, but 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 back to um, the Vim Vendors. Um, that was where we got to meet Angelo. That was the only time we got to meet Angelo Balhamente. And what a great man! Yeah, and yeah. I could just see where he was. You know, just meeting him, it made so much sense with how the music sounds that he he's right. involved in right yeah. so um and in that one uh which was a real gentle song and julie uh, cruz was singing we went and we went into the kitchen and we took two uh you know paper coffee cups and we filled it with salt and then we taped both of the cups together mouth to mouth so we made a shaker <laughs> uh, using old of, school, yeah, <laughs> of salt because awesome. we wanted it that quiet. Because was it rock salt or was it like just no, table no, salt? No, no, okay, just <laughs> table salt. Stuff. Yeah, okay. yeah. yeah. Sure. So it was very gentle because the whole track was pretty gentle. Yeah, yeah. The drumming no, was yeah. gentle and her voice and all of that. So um, yeah, that that then that, I love the way that turned out. And, yeah, it's uh, really great. Yeah, yeah. And that's uh, so, uh, yeah. And God, God, Julie Cruz, what a talent, boy. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like R.I.P. to well, another she's one. She's kind of like theater as well as, um, I think she did Broadway stuff as well as, you know, kind of being a protege of David Lynch's. You know, I yeah. kind of discovered her, I guess, for, for his purposes. We wouldn't have known her if he hadn't. If from a larger audience of, of yeah. the musical world, yeah. sure, yeah, absolutely, right. yeah. Uh, okay, so I don't want. Well, I wanted to. Um, I, I wanted to bring that up because specifically, I'm just a big Intel the end of the world fan. Uh, but then, well, I, I I don't want to to totally skip over uh, Mavis Staples though. I, I, oh, right, so right. so, so let, let, let's go back a little bit here. Okay. And how did that all come to pass? Was that just like a being a plane with the baby you're playing and opportunity arose or what was? Okay. Uh, Mavis was managed by these two fellas and one of them had run a record company that Rick Holmstrom had been uh, on the, on signed to. Yeah. And, and, and so, they had already gotten Rick to accompany Mavis as a duet, you know, Mavis and guitar right. for a couple of different things, NAACP and something on on Fox or somebody's channel on TV. So they were already trying to get her a new band. Right. So ends up they have these Thursday night concerts at Santa Monica Pier in the summertime, like 10,000 people show up. Yeah. It's a big pier. And then lots of people show up and they just hang out on the sand below it. Anyway, so we're going to open for her. 
with Rick cool. and the band. <laughs> yeah, not bad. And, yeah. <laughs> and, and yeah, and so we do our 45 minutes and then we're like, okay, oh no, keep playing, keep playing. All right. You know, hour and 15 goes by. Uh-huh. Keep playing, keep playing. You know, so like after an hour and a half, hour 40, I don't know what it was. We we're like, <laughs> we're, we're done. What in the hell is going on? Yeah, what what is there left to play at that point, right? <laughs> well, we had plenty of songs, but I mean, look, I mean, you know, what's we're happening? Op- we're openers, yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So anyway, this is this is what you don't want an opening band to right. do normally. <laughs> exactly, right? <laughs> Go like get two times shit, over their time. <laughs> do your shit and get out of here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So anyway. so anyway, turns out her band they screwed up their stuff and they didn't leave the airport. So they were waiting on stuff or something. So so we met her, and she was so cool. Rick already knew her. Sure. And we, t- we just discussed a few songs, and so we went out and backed her up. And, and then when their band did show up, then we just put them on our gear, and they finished out the set. And they finished out the set. Wow. Whoa. What an audible. And, <laughs> and so what we found out was that they were like, these guys who were firmly embedded in the seventies as far as jazz, rock, funk fusion. Right. And it was to us, it was a real oil and water situation. And, you know, when we when so anyway, basically six months later, we, we ended up that we were her band. Right. After that situation. And um, Ry Cooter was there the whole time. He looked like this homeless guy, <laughs> standing on the side of the stage with these expensive white rim glasses on, you know, and we're like, who is that guy? You know, right, right. There. He's a wild looking dude. Yeah. Yeah. And so he goes, I think that other band was way better for you than, than your band. You're getting props from Ry Cooter. That's pretty good. <laughs> yeah. So, um, so, but, and, you know, we don't try to play old timey or anything of this sort. We yeah. just try to play kind of just good, solid accompaniment, you know, without yeah. without all these. Well, she's a legend. Seven, I mean, stable singers, you know. I mean, e- it's not funk edges and what have you, you know. Yeah. Not all that super tight, crisp. It's got to be a little more Al Green, a little bit more Stax, you know, yeah. influenced. Yeah. So people would say, God, man, what, you guys are like cross between Billie Holiday and the Red Hot Chili Peppers, you know, because because <laughs> we'd have people on the side of the stage just headbanging. Rocking out, you know? sure, but, yeah. But then she gets quiet and everybody's in tears, you know, because she's just that good. I mean, people yeah. would do standing ovations when she walked out. You know, when we would, we would, we would start the first song and then she would get announced and then she comes out, right? Yeah, and people just stand up and start clapping for her. She hasn't said a word. <laughs> she hasn't actually She's done only anything. Yet. Out. Yeah, she hasn't yeah. done anything except walk out. You know, so. But she's such a powerhouse and such there's an important, a lot of love. Yeah. Yeah. And such an important part of history. Right. I mean, all the way back to like stable singers. That's oh like, my I God. Mean, you know, if well, you know, you know. <laughs> yeah. I mean, they. Um, they kind of discovered Dr. King. Before right. he anybody else knew about it, he was crazy. a preacher at a, at a small church, <laughs> yeah, and they went to his church, and 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 pops stayed and talked to him at yeah. length after the service, and he was just like, "Oh my God, this guy is way we we have, we're gonna we're if he can preach it, we can sing it, you know." Right, right. So we're going. <laughs> We, we're going everywhere. He goes. Well, look, I mean, you gotta re- you gotta realize first off, the Staples were just play straight up popular. They yeah. they they didn't jump around. They didn't do antics. They just came out. Now, of course, they were young. They were. I mean, Mavis was like nine or eight or nine, so they were cute, right? Yeah. Right. 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 Exactly. <laughs> but, yeah. but they had the cute thing, so they did. But but nonetheless. They had the very first million selling gospel record in America. Right. So right off the bat, they're like already like kind of leagues above. Okay. Then there's Pops, the visionary. Yeah. 
no black artists do Bob Dylan. No black gospel artists do Bob Dylan. No black artists do, you know, something's happening here. Stephen Stills, you know, you know, uh, something's happening here. Yeah, yeah. You know, I mean, he's he's mixing and blending all kinds of stuff. It's, see, and I was I was of the age to where when I would turn on the radio, you could it was nothing but staples all the time. They so many songs, yeah. Co- constantly and um pop, pops was a vision it was they were like black hippies because they but they were loved by the black people but they're loved by white they everybody loved the staples that's my basic comment is like there's nobody who doesn't like the staples absolutely and they're not they're not just a black thing they're a black white they're universal and i think pops in his universal heart of making these choices of songs and what have you it was like i mean dub it was meant to be that he would be that open to bridging the gap between the the, the cultures yeah sure i mean look at look yeah. at jagger and richards they were fans obviously <laughs> yeah yeah i mean i mean when when uh, keith was there he's wearing a mavis staples t-shirt yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, and it's it, it and it's this kind of interesting uh, who doesn't 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 get in the history books to a certain degree, but uh, it, it's just I mean that's just uh, uh, sometimes you're just oh they're still operating and they're doing good work, amazing. That's lo- you know that's lovely. That's, I know, I know. <laughs> that's no, I I mean something to live for. You know, it's just like I said. You know, it's like I, I'm setting up my drums every day on tour with Bob Dylan yeah. and listen oh, yeah, to that them, guy, <laughs> listen, listening to them rehearse. Yeah. And I'm like, these guys are so good at music. I mean, this yeah. music is so well played, you know, I mean, just extremely good. You listen to the David Bowie's reality tour. I went, I, yeah, I, I played Michael Garson is on keyboard. This guy is a genius at keyboard. I got to tour with him with the Smashing Pumpkins, but I mean, all I'm saying oh, right. is, these, yeah, 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 these yeah. guitarists, these guitarists have been around Bowie for eight, for a lifetime, and this music is is just like it's it's not just it's not just a good band. This is these are seasoned veterans. Right. This is this is not some tired run in the mill thing this is these are guys who are playing their asses off and they're old and they and know just how to do it and right. they're and kind of better you know right than yes. your average bear you know i mean nothing against nirvana or anybody but when you put these like veteranos in there and you got somebody like david bowie to back up Look at look the fuck out, man! This shit yeah. is off the hook. <laughs> pretty it's, good, it's pretty damn good, <laughs> and it's kind of a good shot in the arm. I mean, uh, I mean, for me, I feel like I, you know, I've played some cool stuff most of my life, but I mean, I feel as good or better about my music now than I ever did. So you know, yeah. it's it is it is. We're gonna go to our graves thinking. Well, I could have done that a little bit better. Oh, I oh, wish sure. I could get better Whatever. at that. You know, there's just it's a it's this never ending story that we're we're playing out here. But yeah, yeah. How'd you end up throwing in with Dylan? Because I do find it interesting that uh, I and I I like anybody who's a reasonable music fan. You have to you do indeed have to hand it to the fact that Dylan has written a million amazing songs. But oh then, my god. But then also Bob Dylan wrote propaganda songs by the Minutemen. Love that song as well. And that's always hilarious because it's, of course, the connection to Mike Watt, which is how I know you. Uh, yeah. But how did you throw in with Dylan? Because there's so many ways to go. But I, I do. I am interested in that. We haven't talked about that at all yet. Yeah. Just it was just because um, he wanted Mavis to, to go on tour with him. Yeah. So we <laughs> basically that was it. That's and awesome. <laughs> apparently he liked me george roselli with a drummer was always like oh dude you're in man because if 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 dylan's assistant talks to you this woman this is meaningful right that means this had happened that means something yeah 
uh, because you basically keep your distance from Bob, you know, and he's yeah. cool when you're around him and, you know, he will interact a little bit, but, um, but you're basically kind of, kind of just leave him to himself. Yeah. You <laughs> Better you just like to leave him, him to his well, own well, company. Well, no, you don't go up and like, hey, uh, how about them Dodgers? You know, right. that, you know, it's like, you know. It's not that kind of guy. That might get a, that might get a dirty look. Yeah, I don't know. But no, he was, he was, you know, we all had our brushes where, like I'm packing up my gear and his security guy who actually happened to be security on the Smashing Pumpkins tour that I'd gone on. Oh, yeah. He says, okay, can you move over here for a second while I get him out of here? And I go, sure. So he goes, and then he comes by, okay, all clear. So I go back to doing my packing. Lo and behold, who's coming down who isn't clear? Bob Dylan has been straggling behind. And so <laughs> here I am, like like from here to you, you yeah. know, like five feet. <laughs> Dylan looking up your drums. At me, and I'm trying not to do like – deer in the headlights you right. know like make yeah. him feel awkward and he's he's you know he's like thinking probably i don't want to be a dick i just want to be cordial and get you know so yeah i'm sort of like hey hi you know he's like hey what's up you know boom we're done it's all good yeah but yeah. <clears throat> nobody stepped on anyone's foot you know it but, worked out but, fine <laughs> yeah because you don't want to like overemphasize that he's maybe a little bit heavy-handed about you know don't get up in his face but yeah. then on the other hand when it comes when it comes to it he's he's gonna be a friendly man you know sure. which he was yeah yeah he's just probably you know he's in a world that you can't let too many people in immediately you have to kind of let it's been too many things people would show up at the house apparently Ugh. and want to talk to him like strangers out of nowhere no, i you. mean can you imagine <laughs> that sounds terrible you know? <laughs> i know exactly right <laughs> Like, that's a that's a hard know, pass from me, and I can only so imagine many, being Dylan. Yeah, when people love you that much, you know, it's like, it's why like are you want, at my home? Please, please do not be at my home. You love right this now. stuffed animal so much, you've worn it, worn all the hair off. Of it, sure, you know, it's yeah, like, yeah. Well, and then it's it's just like there's so much history with that guy. I mean, I think about like the Pennebaker documentary, like oh yeah, you know, and that yeah. was like '67, and he was dealing with this kind of thing. Oh and, yeah, and yeah. just like. That dude's been like cultural flashpoint multiple times over, you know. And and of course, everyone the hated whole... when he went electric, which is like, oh what? my god! I mean, so many people were so rude. Yeah, I mean, amazing. It's like it's the same songs, man. What's wrong with you? <laughs> but they were caught up in the trappings of it, you know. Yeah, and, and, and he's, I mean, he's had to a... like deal with so much on a just a daily basis for so long. It's like what? I mean, it's crazy. It's a crazy world. It's coming up next week, the, Bob Dylan. Kidding. No. Yeah. No, maybe not the <laughs> kindest term, but but there are lots of music Nazis, you know. Yeah. Yeah. People yeah. who are just like, oh, jazz, you know, oh, they they turn their nose at any you know, not everybody is a universal soul, you know. I mean right. I'm not saying and not saying that the whole there's a whole bunch, but there's a small percentage of people who don't want things to change. And so Yeah. You know they can get pretty pretty irate about things, um, and and most for me most of my favorite artists and you know, I try to embody my own art around and like they're always moving they're always right. trying new stuff and you don't want right. it like if you make something that sounds like the last thing that isn't a success that's a failure like you know it's like it shouldn't sound exactly like the last thing there should be something you're trying that's different. The you would hope you would pray for some growth. Absolutely. That yeah. would be nice. Absolutely. I mean, don't get me wrong. Like I, I adore like ACDC and the Ramones and stuff. And, but like, those are exceptions. That's, that's not the rule. Most it's, it's there's, it, it, there are two things I would love to teach to the world. And that's critical thinking and taking chances on new things. Right. No, I mean, there's certain, there's certain groups where it it's, if you don't learn their parts, verbatim it's sacrilege it's like <laughs> oh my god You're serious really seriously you know so yeah um which goes back to tom right because i mean i i still i was my mind was blown when it was like uh eh, some talk show appearance or something and it's like oh this is like a totally different arrangement of the song i think from um one of the uh 
uh, what, uh, what the uh, a bone machine or something along. I can't I can't remember what it was, but like mm-hmm. just like the arrangement was like this is completely different than how it was on the record, but it's still the song. I mean that's just. It's it was yeah. mind blowing in a certain way because it's like oh, he's doing this completely differently. And there's a yeah. bunch of people that they want to hear it the way they've heard it on the record. And no, absolutely. And, and too, Dylan does the same titty. thing. You, you, <laughs> oh my I know. god! Yeah, it's I know, like, right? Here's you're halfway through the song and you go, "Oh, this is watching the river flow." You know, <laughs> I, I would have wouldn't have never, I would have never known it. You know, you until figure I it finally, out yourself and you're in the I band. I finally yeah. heard that word. You know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because what it was are we so, doing? It was, was so different yeah yeah and, and that's you know like and i you that know, takes I, artistry too don't get me wrong and i i get that that can be you know and and then i had seen dylan here in long beach where i live california and he played uh like a rolling stone at the concert and it sounded yeah. just like the record right and 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 i I had like these explosions going off. I mean, I've never had anything like this happen to me before. It's like, yeah. it kind of made me realize how people can be so happy about some song you think is just like a dumb song or something. Not that yeah. that's Dylan's song, but just just the idea that when somebody plays you the song, you're like, well, it, it can really mean a lot, you know. It can, it can connect it can, in a totally different it can way. Connect in a way that you, yeah. that you have no prior experience. So I felt like I felt like it it, it erased even maybe some I don't know snobbishness in me, or I don't know. It just sure. it just yeah. enlight it kind of enlightened me. Like wow. It just kind of gave me more respect for people like whatever the hell you like. I mean, I'm not going to judge your ass right. for it, you know, and because my mind has been just blown when I heard boom, boom, jack. It's like, holy shit. It's just like, like, like fireworks are going off inside me. So, yeah, there's I mean, always <laughs> something. I've, something I've, I've, I've been guilty in the past of being very judgmental of certain certain bands and maybe certain overplayed songs and then and, yeah. and you know maybe even let's talking uncharitably about them and then see it played live in front of like their crowd it's like oh, okay i get it all right, right. right. <laughs> and, it's, and yeah. it's like these people are having this emotional incredible moment and yeah you know it's hard to get mad about that and be like hey no, you guys are idiots <laughs> it was so funny you know? too it's like like we were there and I'm serious. Like this song's like, really basic. Four or five, <laughs> four or five people had come up to us yeah. and said they were late, and they were like, "Oh, what songs have they done?" You yeah. know, they wanted to know what songs they had done. Right, right, right. And right. and this was before I heard this song, and the, the one I was talking about. Yeah. Know, like, and I'm like, uh, I don't know, you know, because some of them are kind of different. Yeah. So what, could, what am I, the court stenographer? I, I couldn't <laughs> ra- I couldn't rattle anything off. Sure. But sure. I think that was to set us up for like people really care about the songs. They like, really, they yes. really do, yeah. right? The context and, of where they are next to each other, even right, something yes. like that. Yeah. It could, it could just be one, two. It could be many, I guess, or even just who knows. Yeah. All, all I know is that. A lot of people, like, it was getting kind of like, okay, already, go away. You know? <laughs> yeah, get, I don't get know. away, kid, you're bothering me. <laughs> like, yeah. no, really, like three or four couples, maybe five, yeah. were, like, wanted to know. And, like, I'm looking around like, ask somebody else. I don't know. I don't know. I used to work so, with a guy so at, it, yeah. at, at a day job that, um, you know, whatever, like my age, uh, maybe even a little younger. And he was one of those guys. Like he would like when whenever Dylan would play, he would like go to every show in like uh-huh. California. Yeah. And yeah, he was like, oh, he played. and I would ask, you know, just, you know, as I know he was excited about. It. I was like, oh, how was the show? Oh, great, he played this, this, this. It was like, oh, okay, whoa, we're getting the the. This is like the in depth report. This is like, right. You, you know, when Congress has like you know the the sort of broad sheet, and then they release the actual reports like eighty pages or something. It's like, oh, I'm getting the eighty page report of this. Okay. Right. Wasn't wasn't really what I wanted, but I'll I'll let it ride out because he's really excited about it. Yeah, yeah, he's yeah. He's just that kind of artist, you know. And that's I mean, look, it's not to say that I I probably couldn't do the same thing about a certain artist myself, but uh, it's just it's interesting that for whatever reason, Dylan especially is like it seems to spark that in a lot of different people across generations yeah. too. 
Well, yeah, and Dylan, I think he goes on tour because he likes to play and like he likes to show up in the mid afternoon and, <laughs> and 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 play some music with his yeah. band. Yeah, yeah. And and oftentimes we wouldn't even hardly get sound checked because he would change things so drastically that they had to keep rehearsing. Right. We're doing a jazz style now. Okay. We're do sure. this, this way. Yeah. Or this, like did something with a surf beat one time. It's like, <laughs> Oh my God. You know, it was like all over the map. Yeah. 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 But what are you going to do? It's Bob Dylan. <laughs> you know, so he's no, going to do what he's going to do. That's why he does that. That's why he does that. So he can, he can, he can reshape his music. Yeah. yeah. And, yeah. and it, it, it's, it's a way for him to keep it alive. Uh, rather yeah. than have it be, you know, like just like we're, we're doing the show, we're doing the the big Broadway show that has like the no, he can't, the songs. He can't keep doing all that over and over. He just he's he's too much of an artist, you know. He's yeah, not he's that guy. Yeah, right. yeah. Uh, let's go back to the Firewalk with Me soundtrack, which I think is. Uh, Fantastic! Like what one of one of the best soundtracks, uh, radically misunderstood movie at the time. Because talk right. about like people like not being the thing that people wanted it to be. <laughs> well, confusing people's like you, you do this whole TV show and then you finally do a movie that explains what happened. Yeah. In the TV show, it's like, yeah, it's crazy, crazy to right? explain yeah. think of now because everything's so intermingled. But like, no, that just wasn't done. And then it's like, right. oh no, but it's a prequel. And like the characters that you really like don't show up until about you know a third of the way through, and like there's things that like people like now Lynch is like expected to be doing that, but at the time I just remember the the howling about it of like yeah people were just not down at all, and like it was almost to a point of like if he was like, trolling them like you could he, you know he would have been oh very successful, but it's not it's just David Lynch it's how he does things and that's that's fine, uh, but but what a what a great banger soundtrack. Uh, oh and, yeah, yeah. And that's uh, how did that all come together? Okay, so that was when Dave Alvin didn't want to come back. He didn't want to. Come, he was in. He was in uh, San Francisco, and he didn't want to. <laughs> just did. What wasn't feeling it? Like what was? It uh, just needed some rest. Okay. And didn't right, realize. Right. I, I'm not sure if he realized what the whole situation was. Yeah. Uh, but, but basically, and David Jariki was probably living in Saint Croix you know, an island, you know, yeah. uh, at the time. But he yeah. happened to be visiting his family. It was just one of those meant-to-be things, right? Yeah. And so uh, David Lynch calls me up and says, you got a guitar player? And just so happened that I had just gotten off the phone with Jariki. And so <laughs> right. I said, yeah, yeah, we do. And so basically we went to uh, Capitol Records, up there in Hollywood, the, the the building that looks like it's stack of records, it's round. Yeah, yeah, it's like you a can sil- see it right cylinder. off the freeway. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, well, yeah. Right. Okay. And so, basically, David Lynch wanted a three note bass line. That was his big big thing in his head was a three note bass line. Yeah. So he got working with Don Falzone, and Don was playing the stand up bass with the bow. Right. So, uh, 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 yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that was basically it. And and then I'm not sure exactly where we, but we settled on the triplet. Kind of, yeah. a, you know, slow blues, tri- stripper kind of beat, I guess. <laughs> totally, and then, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then, um, and then Lynch and the engineer put a, put a triplet delay in tempo and so all of a sudden i'm like i'm at a headley grange you know with uh with uh whoever that engineer was and um you know john bonham you know uh when the levy broke or something yeah 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 yeah. only in a triplet form right yeah yeah yeah, yeah sure so all of a sudden it's like adding to our vibe and adding to like we're getting more out of every note. So we're not even like space, you know, it's allowing us to play me to play less and still make, make a lot out of it. Right. 
Like it and sounds so, like it's recorded real, real close, like real, real compressed kind of. Uh, oh just, yeah. Like not like banging it out necessarily, but real, real. Solid. Yeah, I mean, we didn't, we weren't, we weren't playing soft, but we weren't playing like viciously yes. hard either. Yeah. Not like blue cheers. <laughs> <laughs> no, not, 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 we weren't, we, we weren't growling, you know? Right, right, right. Um, and so, uh, and we, we did another one uh, and it was called Blue Frank. And that plays a little bit later in the movie. Yeah. But it's a much more angular, not nearly as fun as the Pink Room. Yeah, but pink. the Pink Room just really caught a, a vibe, you know, just the, the whole thing of it. Apparently, it was like a coffee house classic at the time. People, I'm, the hipsters liked it. And, and I love the song. And a lot of people talk to me about the song sure. um, as being something special to them. And it was special to us. And I mean, even 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 the ending where there really wasn't an ending, we had played and played. And so I just started hitting these big yeah the, the know, more crashy crashes yeah. i just <laughs> and i thought you know oh, he'll cut this out you know yeah and then when he left it in i realized nope. <laughs> you know that's actually good music you know yeah, it's, yeah it seemed like such a throwaway kind of part and then i realized no that's actually and you know you learn in reverse sometimes you learn by what you you don't exactly know what you're playing and then when you hear it back you go Oh, that's a good idea. That's yeah. almost nothing, but that sounded really good at the top, you know, for that particular part of the song. So, um, cause it, cause a, even a small change like that can like change up the dynamic. I know. I know. So it was, dramatically. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, um, I mean, I remember Cheryl were, Lee just giving like props, uh, to, to that song specifically about it. Oh, like, really? Yeah. 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 She, nice. Like, yeah. Which I mean, it's it's it perfectly embodies the vibe, like as as yeah. much so as anything else within the Twin Peaks world. Just uh, maybe aside from like the main theme song, you know. Oh, interesting. <laughs> yeah. The the, uh, the okay, so we did this on a Monday, and then Tuesday and Wednesday we were on set. We were we were in the scene. Right. Oh, right. Because you're in the. Yeah. <laughs> sure. Of course. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. and and they're they've got speakers that are big, and they're playing our music plenty loud and and lynch keeps going more smoke more smoke you know <laughs> there is a lot and they of have, smoke there they yeah, have the right. red <laughs> the red clear uh, uh light bulbs and the white clear light bulbs strung yeah. around the room and they've got all these people in all this fancy french underwear and a, a girl has to strip naked on the stage with us every time we do a take right. um Sounds People terrible. are having yeah. oral sex <laughs> underneath the booths and everything. Right. Yeah. So it was definitely the most sexed up scene in the whole movie. And so we go there on a Tuesday and then we go back on the Wednesday. It's the same shit. The next day they actually yeah. added a guy who had to strip too. Right. <laughs> he never made it, he never made it into the movie. But it right. was just like, oh, just another day at the office, honey. You yeah, know, yeah. No Clocking in. No, <laughs> exactly. no big deal here, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so so it was a really unique in my life kind of experience sure sure yeah and then after that we we there's a wreck because david drake has passed away that's the fox young. of course which is horrible. the fox, fox bad bad strategy, strategy right yeah. right yeah so that that resulted in that and we probably would have continued but then david lynch had a divorce and yeah. so so all of a sudden we weren't getting together anymore. Yeah. But I guess we got about six or eight songs out of that that became that record. Yeah. A tribute to David. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. And that's, a, I mean, it, it's so interesting because it's, uh, there's such a cultural shorthand for it that, you know, it, it's just, there's certain things in, in life that are just undeniably cool. That's a cool thing. There's right. like no, yeah. even, no matter your thoughts on Twin Peaks or Fire Walk with me specifically, that is a cool thing. Right. <laughs> the funny thing too is like we would we would get together in the studio and we didn't really know what we were heading for. Right. We would start getting you know tried I guess tried different beats, but pretty soon we would land on one beat and then. Yeah. 
that would stay. And then Dariki would, would, I don't know, just start creating chord changes somehow. Yeah. And next thing you know, we have a song form. And then Lynch hands Jeriki a, a piece of paper <laughs> with with a list of words on it. Oh, that Jeriki... th- 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 he wrote for the wow. Okay, oh, yeah, yeah. And then Jeriki would go out, and he would just like look at the look at the words, yeah. listen to the music, make up a melody on the spot in real time. Not like oh, give me another take, give me another take. He would like start kicking ass right away just be going and just sang these songs i mean they can break your heart some of those songs yeah and this is the best recording of anything that we've ever gotten for david jariki so i was really happy about that part of it but but david's just innate music ability you know jariki's ability to staggering in a way just staggering you know so yeah the fact that he could just walk out there and make a melody and right. sing these songs like <laughs> like this is he wrote it practically like he wrote it and he this is what he meant to do for months on end he had 5 minutes was what he had to start yeah well and it's crazy cuz like with david lynch like it's it, music is so essential to his to to his to the films like you think about like oh, you sure. know the uh <laughs> The Dennis Hopper, uh, Roy Orbison song in, oh, uh, sure. <laughs> in Blue Velvet, oh, I know. you know, I know. yeah, yeah. <laughs> with, that, with that crazy karaoke setup, and uh, the Lady in the Elevator song and Eraserhead and and and, and a Wild at Heart. Like, there's all these like this u- this unique importance placed on music with within the yeah. work, where it's like very intermingled with the visuals, and 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 Lynch. Um, he is like the the fifth beetle you know he's right he's because we're we're vibing off each other but i constantly am you know going back to looking through that window i remember it at at capitol because the 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 window for the control rooms is kind of like up a story or something so you're kind of looking up and i'm constantly looking up at him is like, is there any signal he's want to give or anything, you know, because sure. he, he's that involved, you know, I mean, even with Angelo, he's like, okay, that's good. But can you do that same part, but up higher or, or down lower, you know, right. Have you know, he, he, he'd have these pretty insightful uh, observations that he would make requests, you know, it's like, I like that part, but can you play it? lower you can play an octave lower or yeah who knows what i'm just saying he's he's a good ally to have especially because he's in charge and it's his his scene anyway so yeah i mean yeah ultimately it's, right yeah. it's like it's kind of like working with tom or something you know it's like they're gonna get their stamp on this thing and that's part of why what what you're there for is to is to be part of that. And he also, wants you to do the thing that you do because yeah, you wouldn't be there otherwise. And Exactly. But he's going to have to put his essence in there as well. Yeah. Thankfully. Yeah. yeah. yeah For sure. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. That's, I mean, it's a hell of a soundtrack. And it's, it's, it's a, again, it's a, a crazy well, thing to be involved with. I think Firewalk with me, especially like, I think it, time has redeemed it yeah. to a certain degree. You well, know? you know, and all those great New York jazz players, you oh, know, sure. uh, yeah. playing, um, Grady Tate, I think, played the drums. Such a great drummer, you know. Yeah. Um, and um, so, yeah, they just, yeah, just music well played. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. T- tell me about doing uh, contemplating the engine room with Watt. Okay. Was that your well, first that... T- time playing with them? That's yeah. how I came to know from yeah. drumming. So. I were, I think when that came out, I think it worked at the record store. So, um, that was that was um, my very first real encounter with Mike. I'd, I'd known about the Minutemen, but I was already kind of old, you know, <laughs> for that. And I felt punk as fuck anyway. So sure, 
I didn't really need punk music to to give me some allegiance to something, you know, yeah, because yeah. I was already kind of all signed up with my allegiances and what have you. I was in a, I was in appreciation of what they were about. And, and I knew that the Minutemen were a big, a big deal and yeah. that people, there was a lot of love for those guys. So, but I, I was, you know, I was raising children. I mean, I, I, I didn't, I didn't need punk rock. I was, I was already 30 some odd years old, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. It, it, music uh, is, it's not, that's not important to you, but it's not your, your entire look, life. I was happy it. that so many people were happy about it. You know <laughs> what I'm saying? It's I do. Like, yes, I do. Yeah. Yes. I really, i support supported completely, yeah. you know, because there's plenty of music that, that needed a kick in the ass as well, yeah. for sure. So, um, but, but, but Mike knew that I'd worked, you know, like I played Broadway scores. I played, you know, uh, West Side Story, a bunch of different <laughs> right. things. Yeah, yeah, you yeah, know? totally. Yeah. I'd been reading music my whole life, you know. So um, and then I'd worked in theater and in dance and all of that. So uh, and then this was his first his first punk rock opera, the very first right. one. Yeah. yeah. And and also I don't know. I guess I guess there was some sort of long distance trust in me that he had because Nels Klein is a really nice man, very sensitive man. And, you know, I was sensitive to the fact that this was his first time he was going to start talking about D. Boone, who had, who had died right. like 12 years prior. You yeah, know? yeah. So this shit was like, like, it's momentous just because of it, that alone. Well, it yeah. was, it was, yeah, exactly right. And and so this was like super heartfelt for for Mike, like almost you know to the point of hard to do for sure. You know, emotionally hard to do. Obviously, he hadn't even been able to broach the subject for twelve years, apparently. Right. So, so anyway, <clears throat> sort of out of the blue, he gives me a holler. And then we start, um, uh, I guess, I don't know whether we started rehearsing in San Pedro at Angel's Gate, where he has this room he's had for like 30 or 40 years, yeah. or or we just went directly. But, but you know, Nels Klein is such an amazing guitarist oh, as well. Oh, he's so great. Yeah, so, so yeah. inventive. So cool. Yeah. yeah. And, not, and a very heartfelt, and he has a twin brother. Really? Yeah, twin brother. And the funny thing was, is that all these dance teachers, when I started accompanying dance, they were always talking about this guy, uh, Alex Klein, you know, because he was up in L.A. And he was accompanying dance classes up yeah. in L.A. Oh, uh, funny. I'm like, <laughs> oh, Alex Klein, he's really out there, man. He's cool. You should meet him sometime and everything. Yeah. And then I, And then I'm working with Nels Klein, but I'm not putting it together. And I don't know when I finally got told my, I have a brother, a twin brother named Alex Klein. That's crazy. Yeah, I know. But anyway, yeah. But, um, but we would go, we would talk, Mike would get us going on these grooves and we would play and play and play. And we kind of work things, refine things just a bit. But then finally, because I, I still don't know any song forms yet, right? Right. And so then he starts cutting things down into bite-sized pieces. You know, here's the verse, here's the chorus. You know, and all of a sudden, okay, now we're getting into some math here. You know, we got yeah, we have to keep track of this shit. Yeah, it's a lot um, to keep track of. Sure, yeah. There is, there was, yeah, and and even in, with MSSV, it's still the same story because. Even with Waits or with Lynch, the music is more open. Yeah. And and your your the the inflections and the things you do have a lot to do with the feeling of the whole thing. But with Watt and with 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 Baguetta, there's that. But there's also just you got to do this part, you know, eight, 
you know, 16 times, then go back and do that other part eight times, then go back and do the other thing 24 times, then go back and then go to the third part and go do that and then go back. It's like, oh, my God, you know, there's a lot to to handle. Yeah, there's a lot to remember, you know, and so those guys are more equipped to handle that. I I get it in the long run, but but they're they're more used to that style of music in a way. Because that's how they've always done their their stuff in their know? various in the various ways, yeah, 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 <laughs> yeah. So that was always kind of a challenge for me, and it still remains a bit of a challenge. Is like um, I like to get as much practice in ahead of time as I can because I'm kind of a visual learner, and um, and it takes it it takes me some time sometimes to get all this stuff down. Yeah. To get the nuance of it and, and all that. Yeah. Yeah. To get, get past just keeping the parts together and, and right. you know, actually start playing music as yeah. well as the song. <laughs> <laughs> Which, yeah. I mean, that is a thing, right? Where you're not just like clearly Making trying sure. to remember, okay, it goes this here, it does that yeah. there. <laughs> now, when do I go back to that again? Uh, eight, are we, is this eight or nine? Shoot, did I do, yeah. did I do eight? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Or so I hear, anyway. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly. And definitely not when trying new songs out, and definitely not recently. <laughs> but I think that it's, uh, but that, I mean, that's a, such a, the Contemplating the Engine Room record, it, I mean, it's a powerful record for a number yeah. of reasons. Um, uh, not, you know, all, all of which are, were mentioned. And and that's kind of how, uh, and, and that, that came to be known as uh, you and Mike and Nels was like uh, Black Gang. Right, if I remember, if I remember right. correctly. the Black Gang yeah. crew, yeah, yeah. And uh, that kind of, obviously that worked well. That's something that uh, you uh, kept up playing for that for a long time. And then with Main Steam Stop Valve, I mean, uh, Wallflowers was uh, Keltner. Um, how how did this how did this come together from your perspective? Because I've now had all three of you on, and I think that that's interesting. But I'm inter- I want to okay. hear from your perspective now. Well, it sort of seems like like because I thought because the record that we supported for Mavis, yeah, th- that was Jim Keltner who who after that we actually made the records ourselves, and we we actually got our first Grammy on the first record. The second record we made, the first record was a live record. The second record was produced by Jeff Tweedy, and we recorded it there at um, their studio in Chicago. Sure, yeah. And, and um, so <clears throat> that got her her first Grammy. But um, oh, get me back on track. Okay, We're, so <laughs> so, I'm so sorry. So. My understanding is that uh, you came in on like it was like a ten day oh, tour okay, or something, right? right? So, some some okay. being for Keltner, and that's well, Keltner. Okay, you know Keltner's not going to tour. He's not right. going to sleep on people's couches or floors or whatever. You know? It's not his vibe. Yeah. Nah. <laughs> peace and love. Peace and love. <laughs> but you know, and this is this is not the only situation where I've kind of followed behind Keltner. Um, you know, and so, uh, but but there are similarities in our in our approach because we both have a jazz background, we have percussive background as well, and so um, they decided that they wanted to to, to do some touring, and yeah. they knew that Jim wasn't going to tour, and so. Watt said, "Well, you should call Hodges then." You know, so basically that was it. that was it. Yeah, and it's it's easier for me to play in a band that Mike doesn't lead, even though he does. If you're going to be in a band with him, he's gonna he's gonna lead. He's gonna have a lot to say anyway. It's but, sure. Yeah. But but um, but. But it's kind of easier that it's baguette is the, in charge. It, it, and that's charge. and some people don't realize that. I, I do know. I mean, when MSSV kind of first came to my attention is in 2019, where 
there's a few places that we were playing that I was like, what's this MSSV band? Why are they <laughs> why are right. we playing the same time that they're playing like everywhere? And, uh, uh, but but I didn't know who Mike McGetta was at the time. And then I was like, oh, he's right. like this Nels Klein kind of like guitar player dude. And it's kind of like yeah. his deal. And this is a different band. That's why it's right. got a different name. Okay, it makes sense. And, 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 and the MSSV is another a bit of Watt genius in that who in the hell wants to say mainstream stop valve that's that's a stupid name but mssv that's cool yeah that's cool <laughs> and it's easy to remember right yeah 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 <laughs> it, but it just so happens that it laces into watts continual navy mm-hmm. you know reference just everything navy you know so yeah, yeah. Very, very nautical very no, yeah. yeah it's got it's got it's that like, <laughs> it's like you don't you know you don't turn right you don't turn left you go starboard you go port yep. you know and you don't say over there you say you know um start two o'clock starboard or, or uh nine o'clock port you know yeah it's like be specific about your language you know that and what is really big on that because he does all the driving, he, he, yeah. you know, and it makes sense. It makes sense. But it's it's kind of hilarious at the same time. Yeah. Can I tell you, I talked to him earlier today. Oh, okay. Because uh, I, I, uh, I, I'm, me and Lung are going to be on his show. It might already be out at this point. I don't know. Oh, right, right. Oh, <laughs> Which yeah, is really yeah. funny that it happened to be the same day. Because originally, we, as you know, we were going to do this yesterday, but I was traveling right. and it wasn't going to be back in time. But it's... It is hilarious to be talking about him when I was talking talking to him, I don't know, six hours ago or something along those lines. Oh, my God. Uh, but yeah, so it was interesting to me, and, and I wish I, I actually did not catch any of those shows, um, mainly because I think we were out at the same time. But there was sort of like, so there was the Wallflowers material, right? But I remember you're doing like a Stooges song. And I think the Pink Room ended up in the set. Too, we did right? the Pink Room in the first, yeah, bit. Yeah. Which which is awesome. I would I would have yeah I would would have loved to have seen that. And uh, so, did you know? How did you know Bagetta? Did did you know or did you know Bagetta? I did. I met him. I met him, sort of over the phone, and then when he was still living in, uh, I think Kentucky. Mm-hmm. And I was on the road with Mavis, and we went to breakfast, and that's when we first met. Yeah, I think. Yeah, that's that's, and it's funny because it's because it seems like you have a very a natural affinity, uh, right? As a band, and of course that just comes from playing together. I'm sure, but like it's it fits together very nicely. That if if you were to say, oh yeah, those guys have been playing together for for like 15 years or something, then it would be like, oh sure, of course they have. <laughs> but right. it's like that everybody's been what really is everyone has played a long time and knows like the shorthand to kind of get the best out of themselves and uh maybe even like possible stumbling blocks which which is almost more important sometimes and, and i'm speaking about specifically like you know when i saw you in in, in davenport um Davenport, Iowa, everybody. Uh, I was just blown away by like just the dynamics, like that you like really like brought a low, like brought to the point that like if someone was having a conversation, like you know you're like, you're gonna feel like a real dick because there were people that <laughs> <laughs> what 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 schooled a couple of people during that I, that last two months, yeah, uh, yeah, There's yeah, which is hilarious. <laughs> Shut the fuck up, you know? <laughs> yeah, exactly. But it's but but, it, but it's almost something where. You know, you guys being all being uh, so it's well versed as players, like being able to like just bring it down like that, that just like whisper quiet almost. You know, you know some of this. You know, Mike writes the music, Bagetta. Yeah, and and it's 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 great stuff. And but certain certain changes do just occur kind of organically. Um, and the whole dynamic thing, like after the on the first long tour we did, it was seemed like in the last couple of weeks he started adding more dynamics. So the show had been kind of pretty loud for most of it, and so that that was you know that was like almost to the end. Yeah. Okay. So. So then this last tour, the Aki tour, he wrote more songs to sing. And, and 
and we still started out kind of loud and we soon realized that <laughs> we weren't going to be able to sustain and that wasn't actually working for the songs anyway right and i said well you know bb king turns this guitar completely off when he sings yeah exactly Just literally drops it to nothing yeah <laughs> leave and room so, makes it easier <laughs> well you know the thing of it is is like when something isn't there and and you have that quietness people lean forward like right what's right. going to happen yes and then when it comes time and you turn it up and you you blow their talk i mean look Nirvana it means more would, sure Absolutely. Nirvana wouldn't have been nearly as popular if they hadn't done their verses quiet and their choruses raging. You know, absolutely. That was really powerful stuff. Well, that's just simple old school accompaniment rules. Play right. quiet when they sing, play loud on the verse, on yes. the chorus. Yeah. Yes, yes. Basically, you know, play the hi hat when they sing, play the ride cymbal on the chorus, you know. Right. Those kind, that, don't those don't kind be of, going full bore if you're trying to communicate something you want anyone to know. <laughs> so 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 little lo, little by little, um, I have played really quietly in my life, but I gotta say this is as quiet as I've ever played. Yeah, this is with that yeah with that tour and and that was part of what made so much of an impression on people they would constantly mentioning the dynamics and so it just it just kind of makes sense and also you just wear me out playing too loud the whole time <laughs> right. anyway. yeah, yeah exactly <laughs> well and also uh, again if you if you want certain parts to to be as big as you feel like they should be, then there needs to be something to contrast it, or it's all going to be the same. It's going to be uniform. Going to, you know, it's just like if somebody's hollering at you, pretty yeah. soon you kind of shut down. You know, right? Exactly. But if they, you know, but if they speak lovingly to you, you know, right. you're more more enticed to listen. Yeah, and 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 oh come on, Mike is not a singer singer. He's 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 a poet singer you know right. he's a talk singer he may become more of a singer but it's more about the story rather than his trying, vocal pipes. He's trying to communicate something if you're trying to communicate something it helps to be heard exactly you know? exactly yeah. <laughs> and and to be be given that deference with the music to to put the focus on that as well which doesn't mean that like what is happening what else is happening underneath it isn't important it's just that it's serving the song and if and there are bands where the vocals honestly don't matter that much it doesn't, it doesn't really matter no i mean if there's that's all, your thing hey peace and love there's all you know? flavors of accompaniment you know? yeah and and uh, and and if if everybody doesn't participate it doesn't work Right. You know, if one guy doesn't come down, you're not quiet. Yeah. You're, you're, you're two out of three quiet and <laughs> exactly. you're not really quiet, you know. So when everybody really Someone gets didn't get on, the memo. <laughs> on board, yeah, yeah. <laughs> they missed that day in class, you know. But um, but I will say, you know, for as loud as these guys can play, and I can play loud too, but I mean, sure. these are some of the louder players that I, that I work with as far as when they – do get loud you know when, when it's time like, sure absolutely yeah yeah, yeah yeah then that's sort of where that punk rock thing comes in yeah it's like they're more they're more rock than most of the music i play um is not quite that loud when but it's the, loud, but it's yeah. also the kind of thing where you know it may it sometimes maybe it's more punk to play quiet sometimes you know just like well, how no, like when, it, it, when melvin's went super slow after everybody was trying to be as fast as possible and they're like no we're gonna right. go slower we're gonna go as slow as we possibly can and it infuriated everybody you know and it's like good well you you should be upset because it's it, it, things have become too much too formulaic so the idea of like no this is going to be like a whisper so like again yeah. if you're someone that's really got stuff that you feel like you need to tell your buddy about right then and there, you're going to be a real standout and not a good way. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> no matter how big the crowd. <laughs> so yeah, that, you know, and the funny thing too, with that tour, this last tour, Aki tour, yeah. uh, because of the demos, I had a completely different drum set lined up to play on the tour. Right. And, um, 
I learned that don't don't get fooled by the demos sometimes because things may change a lot. But here's okay. the deal was that we ended up getting a new van because Watts right. van had been and we had no room. No room. So I had to go find it's one of those transits, right? Yes. Yeah, we had, had to, to do find... those for a tour. It made me crazy trying to pack the damn thing. Yeah. So I just made and... it Tony's problem. <laughs> <laughs> and and they're they're cause... they're totally okay for non non van nerds. The setup, like the shape itself, is is completely different. Like completely yeah. different. I, I, there's no other way to put it. Yeah, and then we then we have a second floor that's mostly merch. So everything right. music instrument has to go as a slide under there. As a slide under there. So anyway, basically, ended up taking my drum set that was like a copy of elvin jones's drum set you know a little 18 inch <laughs> bass drums, guy. yeah small tom toms but considering the music and the size of some of the venues being really tiny as well but but the music really it was like the universe really gave, gave me a break it really I, I really dodged a bullet there because it turned out that that was absolutely the best drum set for the band you would have the wrong this, kit. You would have been over. I would have had the wrong kit. Yeah, I yeah. would have been stuck with the wrong drums. You know? Yeah, you're tra- you're, so, you're trying to like tippy tap on a 32 oh. inch bass drum. Or yeah, something. exactly, exactly. <laughs> I was, you know, and so the fact that those were tuned kind of tight, like like not as tight as some jazz kits, but still yeah. kind of tight. The projection for the quiet as well as the loud the projection for the quiet wouldn't have come through on the other drums right. because unless you hit them with a little bit more force, they're not going to speak. But because we brought the tighter, quieter, you know, a tighter tuning drums, it was like, Oh my God, I can't believe that, you know, and it's probably the oldest drum set that I, it is the oldest drum set. <laughs> That's I, own, awesome. you know? <laughs> I played the Christmas parade at Disneyland, you know, and, uh-huh, and uh-huh. made, you know, three or four hundred dollars, and literally bought the whole drum set for about three hundred and seventy-five dollars. And somebody was telling me that I could get eight or ten thousand dollars for the drum set now because yeah, it's a Camco, it's a classic, apparently, or something or other. If someone's so, a collector for those things, then yeah, they would be, there's yeah. there's there's drum clubs on you know <laughs> each brand, brand you know. I'm Rogers, sure. yeah. Ludwig, Camco, they're all over Facebook apparently. Yeah. Yeah, I, I got I got a I got a late 70s uh, blue Vista Light Ludwig kit. Oh yeah, yeah. Which yeah. Is, I've got a really great drum set for a guitarist. <laughs> no, <laughs> but that's that those are great. Yeah. The the people that are into like it's just, it's interesting to see like the deep nerdery that happens with people that are like when they're into certain uh oh, manufacturers yeah. or styles oh, or whatever. Yeah. yeah. It gets real well Okay, well, that's that's the, the internet has proved that everybody's a nerd for something. <laughs> exactly. There's nobody who's not a nerd, and everybody's got some yes. for, format to, to to go listen to or read or listen to or watch or something, you know. On the hello, internet. you're yeah. on it. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, but I mean, you know, it's like it's just the goofiest things you never even heard of, and there's a there's a format for these people yeah which is great it's great absolutely absolutely yeah so the i think you guys had something real interesting on this tour because i know that like and i was talking i think i was talking to baguette about it that the the idea that traditionally speaking you 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 tour the songs uh and then and then um you know, you, the, the record recorded, then you tour the songs, right? Like, why not? Do, like, but you played the songs so much better after you've like played them a bunch. Right. So, the idea here was like, hey, let's try a bunch of these new songs, get real good at them, and then record them. Yeah, that's that's the that's the way. And then on the next tour, you support that record, right? And then you've got it. And then when you record it, it's not going to be like the first or second time that you're playing. It's going to be which... you're going to be running hot. I've had times where guys go into the studio. They don't even know their songs. They right. barely even know their songs. Yeah. And now we're making a record with this shit. <laughs> it's like, okay, whatever, you know. Yeah, barely holding on to the. I to know. The thread. I know. So, no, I, it's really interesting that that stuff. 
it really it's like clay you know it's like moldable clay they yeah. really do take on a completely new shape by the time we're done with it and and it improves it improves and he writes great songs it's not so much that the songs change it's the way that they get played the dynamics and what have you yeah right maybe he'll shorten one section or something but there's not but but the the real the juice or the the contrast of this part next to that part and back to that part and then the third part and then all those surprises that none of that really changes it's just how we approach them you have the familiarity changes. to them that you can even make those decisions rather than just trying to yeah it, it well that's the kind <laughs> make sure of, you don't screw it up <laughs> the cool thing about it yeah is that there isn't one guy like tapping his toe, like when are these guys going to catch on? You know, it's right, like right. not everybody has all the answers, you know, yeah. when you're learning his material, these, these songs, what have you, not everybody, even Baguetta doesn't have all his answers, but yeah. as we go through it, we organically find these you're discovering things. it together. Yeah. Right? And yeah. which, which is makes it, it's our saving grace, you know, because, and there isn't there aren't like a couple of lunkheads and one guy with a master vision that is waiting around for these guys to catch up. Yeah. It's like, no, he wrote great songs. Come but, here, you numb skulls. Yeah, exactly. But they still need a little <laughs> bit of they still need a little bit of tweaking as yeah. we find out once yeah. we get into it. Yeah. Hard, yeah. That's that's hard relatable. <laughs> yes. I know, I know. It's pretty cool, you know. It's it's and and I've been in bands where it's, you know, nobody wants to talk about the music, but then this is like the other side of the coin. It's like they won't shut up about the music, you know, but, <laughs> right. but in the long run, that's a good thing. You know, <laughs> sometimes a little hard to take, but it's still it's 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 pot real positive. Well, and, and, and now that I've had the chance to see it live, like I do get why it's you want to differentiate like this is a unique band. This is a band that is not just like it isn't just the Mike Baguetta show or isn't like in the Mike Watt show or the Steve right. Hodges show. It, it's, this is, this is a band in the classic sense of people banding no, together I, to make and, music. And I, you know, and I, and I know, you know, we know that we're playing Mike Baguetta's music, sure. but, but he's, he's, he, he's trying to, to write music that makes sense for who we are. Right. And he does. For who you he, are as players. So get yeah. the best out. Get the, so he, he can get the best out of you and you can get the best out of yourselves. Right. He really does. Yeah. And it, sometimes it's hard to take, but, but, but really it's all, it's, it's all, you know, out of love or, or positive, you know, yeah. tra- we're, we're, if I'm not getting something, you know, they're just like, well, help me, help me help you understand this better. Or, you know, it isn't sure. Yeah. It isn't a what the fuck. It's it's more like <laughs> where do we go from here? You know, yeah. how do we how do we address get this? How do we get there? Yeah. yeah. So so that's you know, that's makes it that makes it easier to take. Yeah. Some I, I I largely ignore the chat, but there's some questions in the chat. Uh this is a good one. Yeah, you're Touring in, I guess, uh, specifically any any stories about touring in Asia or Japan or anything along those lines that uh, you could share? As as close as we're gonna get is that we're in April we're gonna go to the UK and Scotland and Ireland. That's but cool for, for for a couple of weeks. Um, the chances of going those other places they seem very possible, but it hasn't really come up on the radar i guess quite yet yeah it's always such, and, it seems like it's such a crapshoot in this like post-covid mm, world yeah. about like what because <laughs> everybody's kind of trying to do it at the same time and people are averse about going out and excited about going out and maybe in the same sentence <laughs> yeah but like the tour um the haru tour that we did you know about a year and a half ago right Baguetta was just far enough ahead of the curve that he got it booked. Anybody who waited a little bit longer, forget it. It was going to be all booked up, <laughs> yeah. you know. So the people who didn't drag got tours booked, but um, 
but yeah, now, you know, things have opened up more. Um, we'll just have to see where it goes. Yeah. But it doesn't, I don't really think we're a band that wants to tour more than a couple of times a year. Yeah. Well, I mean, you don't want to, you, you want to be enjoyable. You don't want to. <laughs> yeah. I mean, look, I've, 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 you know, spent a lot of my life on the road and I, I played with Mavis for 13 years and I needed to stop touring like that. Right. So the, the fact that I'm touring at all is, um, is kind of an alteration in my overall plan. So the fact that we're tour just a little bit every year is is great. You want to keep it and sustainable. You want to keep it enjoyable. Something you know? that I can that I can sustain. Yeah. 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 Because and, and being out for six months, maybe maybe that would not be sustainable, right? Like there's a lot to handle. Maybe Keltner's you know, got something. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, well, look, I mean, you know, look, Jim Keltner is like so he's 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 part of the 1%, you know, so sure. we can't really even speak. He's more like, you know, up on Mount Olympus or yeah, something. He's an, he's, he's, he's yeah. He's fantastic. He's great, but he's also, um, you know, he, he was, he was exactly the right guy and the right age at the time he got started in the business. Yeah. Not to take anything away from how, how, how good he is, but it's, but, but he's a, uh, yeah. Well, and he's a tough one to be compared to in a ways, but yeah. Sure. Well, I mean, it's apples and oranges too, but it's also, yeah. you know, it, the, the, you're coming from a long lineage of playing with artists and, and making like real true art. And right. maybe that's fine to crash and Kona Neutron's couch once in a while, you know, which hasn't happened yet, but you're welcome to. Right on. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, you know, and, um, you know, I, you, you know, jam a cano and then that means we, you get to do it, you know, like, and then you get to like have these crazy experiences in, in music still and, and push yourself even yeah. though you have made a lifetime of doing it. That's great. So, so I'm, I'm with Mavis and we're at, um, 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 all of a sudden, I can't even remember uh, who the drummer in the band is. Uh, the band band. Um, oh, uh, uh, Omar. Uh, uh, yeah, Helm. Uh, <laughs> Levon Le Helm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Levon. Uh, anyway. It's so, it, it, it's a, you're the guest. It, it's, when it happens to me, it's embarrassing. When to you, yeah. it's just it was dramatic. <laughs> <laughs> so, so anyway, um, basically, and this is another Keltner thing. Yeah. It's like the guys in the band, um, of, in his band that they they came up to me and said, you know, the only guy who sounded as good with Levon was Jim Keltner. So you and Jim, <laughs> So here I am again. Kind All of, these years later. <laughs> kind of link, linked up again, you know. And, Keltner. And I, I, all, all I did was just try to listen to Levon, you know. Just, yeah, yeah, just, yeah. Just let Levon do what he does, and then I just kind of fill in here and yeah. there, you know. And um, and it was really fun to play with him, for sure. And we were going to go on a tour, but then, of course, his life got yeah. cut short so we did we were gonna yeah so we were gonna that would have been pretty cool to co co bill with him for sure um but i do remember we did this reverend gary davis song hallelujah i'm in the band and there's a section where it just drops down to mavis and the drums and so when you play with levon you you merge the sets to where your band plays, but then at a certain point, he comes up and starts playing with your on your set, and right. then some of the other players of his band start playing. So you're kind of like co-mingling the bands. Yeah, yeah, so, you're mingling, sure. So yeah. we get this, we get to this section where it's just the drums and Mavis, and 
so I'm digging in a little bit more, and and I'm over here listening to Levon start digging in on the shuffle and what yeah. have you, yeah. and I'm just like. Holy shit! This is a little slice of heaven, a little slice yeah. of heaven right here, you know. And I don't know whether it's thirty seconds or a minute or two. Could be thirty you know? years. Could be yeah, like thirty it, nanoseconds. It was just like, it was yeah. just like one of these things I, I'll never quite forget, you know. And um, and it was it was neat to hear him, you know, heat up, you know, because he's playing. But then he's like, hey. We're kind of digging in here, you yeah, know? yeah, yeah. And Let's so go he's nuts. like digging in a little bit more <laughs> sure. too. And I'm like, yeah, baby, go for it. You know? Yeah, yeah. So that's anyway, awesome. Yeah, that was a side note there, but yeah. No, that's that's a any and all side side notes and sidebars. Are, yeah, I, I feel like this. That, it, if I started this show now rather than ten years ago, I'd probably call it side notes and sidebars or something because there's so many deviations. Oh, okay. But right. Uh, luckily, I started before you had to have that kind of <laughs> that kind of hook to it. Well, you learn as you go. Absolutely. Yeah yeah, yeah. 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 And yeah. And, and, and again, pod, 10, 10 podcast years is like, I don't know, 50 years or something. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and then the real, it's like dog years. <laughs> but, well, when you put yourself on the line like that, you know, you get, you're going to figure it out or you won't. The, instru- the instructions come to you. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. As and you, and, as you move through it. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, Stephen Hodges, this has, been, this has been so great, man. I'm so glad we, this worked out. I'm, I'm glad we got to do it. Uh, thanks Me for being too. flexible Thank with you. the scheduling. Uh, the hol- holidays are always <laughs> just kind of a, a bit of a... Oh, we are getting in there, yeah. 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 December, yeah. And anytime you got to travel for him, I was a bit of a bear. So I appreciate you being flexible yeah. on that. Uh, I'm super excited. Uh, new MSSV record uh, next year. Uh, I just got the new one. I finally bought a vinyl copy uh, you know i had had two of the three of you on and i finally actually bought a copy uh at oh, that right davenport on. show which near as i could tell is about the only money you got from that show but anyway <laughs> <laughs> oh was that one of the light ones yeah we had a few where not that many people did show yeah uh no no but it, but it was it was awesome like i i, I loved yeah, it we and... just, you know we don't you know we don't play differently but yeah yeah it's I, nice I... it's nice when people yeah yeah. I mean, it's look. There's, there's, it's, it's, it's having come from a. I'm from California, but I'm from a town that has way more in common with something like Davenport than Los Angeles. You know what I mean? It's like, it's always was like a like oh, somebody's playing. There's a band playing. Amazing. You know, great. Let's go see the band that is playing. Not the band with Levon Helm. This the band in general that is playing. Right. Uh, but yeah, I love it. Can't wait for the next one. Um, super excited. Last thing, this is the only can question that I ever ask, and you're okay. you're free to interpret it and answer however you like. But why do you do what you do? Oh, um, it's what I've always done. Um, in school, music was what really got me through school, and uh, I guess I just got you know bitten by the bug, and it's. Um, it still, uh, it still feeds me, you know. And there's still more things to do, so um, yeah, I really, I would be, you know, I'd be cut. I mean, I don't know if if some other kind of job that I could do that was easy to do, and just make some money at, and and. And it wouldn't take up all my time, you know. Maybe that would that would help, you know, lubricate things. But um, that's sort of like reinventing the wheel. And music is what I do, and it it comes nat- naturally, especially now. So I just continue to work in music, basically, because yeah, <laughs> it's really and. You know, the thing of it, too, is like on this last tour with MSSV, um, I got a lot of good response from people. And I actually, I got a lot of good feminine response. And, and I'm not talking hmm. about, you know, hooking up. Not <laughs> at all. I'm talking about just people who talk about the music, you know. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and let's face it. A lot of the shows are 95% men. 
And I do feel like with the dynamics and what have you, that we may be into a, 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 a presentation here that is more universal for boys and girls. You know, a lot of the Minutemen right. fans are men. Yeah, sure. And a few women. But but this is different than the Minutemen music, and it's probably more dynamic than the Minutemen music, even though they probably had dynamics too. But judging from the responses that I got from both men and women, I was really favorably encouraged. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and the girls that would that were brave enough to come up and talk about it you know I was, yeah, I was yeah. really charmed I was like wow this is this is this is good I mean because look all my life I've been I've been basically trying to make the girls dance because <laughs> sure. because if the girls if the girls like it the boys will follow you know so if you play well, the boys will like it anyway. But if you can make the girls like it too, then you're on to something. You're on to something. So I don't know. You know, we'll we'll see how how it all plays out as time goes on. But I got to really shout out to the ladies who showed up to the shows and and were so appreciative of the music. You know, but did my heart good to see both sexes. Uh, in the house yeah it, it's a nice thing it should happen more i agree yeah 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 well i for one i'm glad that you do it and i'm glad yeah. that you were so nice to spend so much time uh with me it's been it's been a pleasure having you man conan thank you man it's been a pleasure and, and, and pleasure's won't... mine as well thank you yeah and yeah. We, we won't say goodbye we'll just say until next time how about that? okay right on that sounds good all right take care brother all right you too bye-bye now there goes Stephen Hodges. What a cool guy. That's awesome. I uh, hope you guys enjoyed that. I'm going to play us out here with the uh, Nemesis V song. This is Say What You Gotta Say.
tell you what to do I think maybe I wanna be just like you You're always right, we're never wrong I know I play the real fool all along MSSV at Say What You Gotta Say off of this year's Human Reaction record. Great record. Highly recommended. I've now had all three members of MSSV on, and uh, I feel pretty good about it. <laughs> Hope you do too. Uh, that was Stephen Hodges. What a freaking cool guy, right? Anyway, the name of the show is Code New Transport Talk Reversal. This sh- show thank you very much for listening to it by the way it airs normally thursdays 8 eastern 7 central 6 mountain 5 pacific streaming live on youtube and twitch podcasted later always everywhere for free protonicreversal.com for those archives but if you like the show and want to get episodes sooner and 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 help support the show patreon.com slash protonicreversal One dollar a month, advance access. That'll get, that'll get you there. That'll, that'll achieve that goal. Uh, thank you ever so much, everyone, for engaging with the show, liking the episodes, sharing them around, talking about them. All that helps people discover the show. And it's a star nice thing to do. Mr. and Mrs. America, all the ships at sea. Matt Cronk of Quee hey, and the, my voice. the band Cunts and many others. Next week. Excited to have him back. I've got That's gonna be awesome. Fifty thousand watts of power. Uh lots of other good stuff coming up too. Stay tuned. Twenty twenty four is the tenth year of this show, so we're gonna, we're gonna be pulling out all the stops. So thank you so much for sticking with it. And yeah, there's lots of more good this stuff to come. And as always, stay safe out there. Can you hear me now? And check you later. Out on Route 128, dark and lonely. I got my radio on. Can you hear me now? Can you hear me now?
Welcome to my top ten. I'd like to thank our sponsor. But we haven't got a sponsor. Not if you were the last man on earth. She was prepared to prove it. This one goes out to a special girl. There is no special girl! It's the, it's the end of radio. The last announcer plays the last record. The last what? Leaves the transmitter. Circles the globe in search of a listener. Can you hear me now? Broadcasting if there's no one there to receive. It's the end of radio. As we come to the close of our broadcast day. Radio. 